this is our second lecture in this in this series of, of design talk. So it's really nice to have John Walter here today, who's I think kind of comes from an interesting perspective for designers to look at. Um, we know that design is a plural. Um, and one of the ways of looking at that polarity is, is, to, is to see design from different perspectives. And I think John's work typifies numerous ways and lenses to look at design questions, design perspectives. Um, so over to John. Um, and we'll have a Q&A at the end. I think it'd be nice to, so just note some questions down as we go through um, and we'll get going. So, hello, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've got a lot to get through. The talk is called Scrambling the Coordinates and I'm a, a visual artist. I'm a, I paint and I draw, but I do a lot of other things as well. Um, so, what I want to first say is you've been programmed with memes and you didn't realize it, but ever since you were born and as you grew, your surroundings, the people, languages and images and objects and buildings and songs you encountered were installed on your brain. Oh, hang on, we've gone too far. And now you're reprogramming yourself and you're re-engineering the memes themselves. So some questions to be thinking as we go. Do we acquire ideas or do ideas acquire us? Culture is not stored in the genes. So where is it stored? It's stored in memes, cultural products. And our work as artists and designers is to constantly re-engineer the memes to update them and help them compete for our attention. So this is a talk about how scrambling the coordinates physically, spatially, conceptually, figuratively or verbally, for example, can lead to better outcomes, design outcomes. That following set paths and then diverging from them, linking them together with others into longer routines, splicing them to create new patterns and using deletion and insertion of code into a given context can transform the outcomes of the creative process. Ultimately, these mutations and adaptations can provide you with a selective advantage in the marketplace of ideas. This is a Paisley teardrop or a bote, which is like a synthetic cell, a virus of the mind maybe. And we all know a lot more about viruses at the moment because of COVID. So like a virus particle, or a host cell, the bote has surface proteins, a cell wall, a cytoplasm, cytoskeleton, a nucleus, and nanomachinery. Why are certain memes successful at replicating across time and space? So these are individual paintings and drawings, each from much larger series that comprise my project Patterns in Time. The Paisley pattern is an example of what Richard Dawkins defines as a successful replicator demonstrating fecundity, fidelity, and longevity. Now the Paisley pattern originates in Persia and travels the Silk Road via trade, where it's woven into shawls in Kashmir under successive regimes before being imported to Europe via the East India Company. And then it's domesticated in Scotland, some other places as well, but Scotland provides it with its name in English, which is named after the industrial town that wove it. What's important to note about the success of the Paisley pattern is that its fidelity is not absolute. As it replicates, it evolves ever so slightly, taking on nuanced mutations, some of which are temporary and others permanent. So evolution plays a hand in the direction of this mimetic drift. This is a computer drawing for the inflected arcade house by the architectural duo Arakawa and Gins. And I exhibit this as part of Shonky, the Aesthetics of Awkwardness in 2016, which I curated as winner of the Hayward Curatorial Open. Arakawa and Gins originated the phrase scrambling the coordinates to describe their attempts to force the body to move and think in new ways using architectural stimuli, sloping floors and walls, unusual domestic spatial sequences, and novel approaches to comfort and discomfort. 
they ultimately sought to stimulate the immune system to extend life. They talked about an architectural body, meaning the space immediately around the individual and available to it as an extended site, a bit like Dawkins idea of the extended phenotype. They also talked about landing sites, meaning the habitual forms of expectation, like anticipating where your foot will fall while walking, which are processed at an imperceivable level in the brain, but which they sought to disrupt for human improvement, to imagine a kind of post-human or transhuman triggered by scrambling the coordinates. In an equivalent way, Kundervasser, here seen through his Rolling Hills project, which became the Rogner Bad Blue Mouse Spa in Austria, believed in an architecture and a kind of building that was integrated with nature and that also employed natural forms in its construction, spirals, uneven floors and imperfection. He described this further in his Moldiness Manifesto, which you should read. These are all tenets of what I mean when I'm describing something shonky. This is an installation shot from the exhibition when it was shown at the DCA in Dundee, featuring Hundertwasser, Plastique Fantastique, Nikki de saint Fal, and Kate Lepper in this view. All the artists demonstrate aspects of the shonky, bad taste, visual awkwardness, imbalance, the provisional, and anachronism, qualities that I value. Qualities that also drift relative to time and space, and therefore have the potential to evolve. Shonky scrambles the coordinates not only of what we receive to be the artistic canon, or of what's fashionable or important, or of how to arrange an exhibition, but it also scrambles the coordinates of my artistic practice. Somebody's got their microphone on, if you could turn that off. Thank you. Taking the role of the curator from time to time is a way for me to disrupt the sequence of my own creativity. It's a displacement activity which forces me to think and reflect differently for a moment. This is an installation shot from Two Peacocks, which I curated in the form of a department store. Using this spatial type to reorganize where objects were placed in the gallery, how they were organized and what the hierarchies were, led to a novel artistic outcome. It also led to fights and fallouts. Nevertheless, scrambling the coordinates is a creative methodology which can be applied to a variety of contexts and at a range of scales. This approach to using spatial design, architecture and installation to scramble the coordinates of a discussion is no better seen than in my PhD project, Alien Sex Club. This is a view of the massive installation when it was first staged at Ambika P3 in London in 2015. Alien Sex Club transposes the spatial logic of a cruise maze onto an art installation to open up discussion about sexual risk. This is the floor plan of the gay sauna sweat box in Soho back in 2015. A cruise maze is a kind of gay imaginary. It thinks about a maze being a space in which we can get lost. Cruise mazes are never that large, unfortunately. They're more like little routines of corridors with rooms off them that can encourage physical intimacy and meeting strangers for sex. I wondered if the maze was an innately risk prone device. And to reduce risk of spreading viruses and other STDs, could you replace it with a labyrinth, which is more meditative and a safe spatial type? These kind of questions are a mental obstacle course in which the coordinates of one's own thinking are scrambled to produce new ways of composing space. Alien Sex Club intervened in the predominantly post-minimal framework that, made, that has characterized representations of HIV since the early 90s. Amongst the paintings, drawings, sculptures, videos, and songs that made up the installation were three live elements. A bar hosted by the Chem Jester, here played by Ash Felito. Hospitality is at the heart of why make. Bars are a great way to meet people, ask questions, and talk about things informally. As host of the bar, or my proxy, uh, people can go to the, the, the host can go towards the audience and engage them further rather than be standoffish or cool. 
There was also fortune telling from Barbara Truvada using my own design tarot cards and free rapid HIV testing in the shed provided by Terence Higgins Trust. So Alien Sex Club scrambled the coordinates on several levels. It organized objects in a completely different way to other exhibitions. It was maximalist as opposed to minimalist. And by this, I don't just mean that it was visually luxurious as has become the recent shorthand for a style of contemporary interior design, although it was visually luxurious, but more than that, it was characterized by complexity. Furthermore, it was a form of scrambling their critical coordinates by reorganizing the representational framework within which the discussion of HIV operated. I used my shonky aesthetics, tragicomic humor, and provocative modes of display to disrupt people's expectations, resulting in an original approach to tackling the subject. Here I am reading Lockdown Tarot at Plymouth Art Weekender in 2020. This is my third tarot set and this one is drawn in tilt brush. It's a challenge to create a new lexicon of images that reflects the moment in time of its making. There are 78 cards in total, so it's a nice big juicy project to get stuck into and you can't just do it in one afternoon. That appeals to me. There's four suits, the antibodies, the vaccines, the receptors and the masks. Then there's 22 picture cards on top of that, the higher arcana. A tarot set is a complex system and reading the cards is like transcribing new strands of DNA, making narrative chains in which concepts, ideas and images are woven together into stories. Performances like this are improvised within the system that I've established. Like a scientific experiment, there are a set of constants and a set of variables, which are played off against each other to issue a set of results. There's enough design space for an enormous range of possibilities to emerge. If the variables become repetitive, it's time for me to scramble the coordinates again and make a new project. Scrambling the coordinates is about disrupting one's own behavioural patterns. The painting on the left is a plate painting by Julian Schnabel from the 80s. And the one on the right is a piece from my series Uncoating, a three mil uh, thick steel sheet. Uh, it's mild steel and it's plasma cut by me and then it's powder coated. It's two metres high and one metre wide. Schnabel talks about using the plates on the surface of the painting to disable his own virtuosity. It's a physical obstacle course for his brush, as well as a mental obstacle course for his pictorial imagination. Taking on unfamiliar processes of drawing and making at certain points in the creative cycle plays a crucial role in how my work develops. Then, having scrambled the coordinates for my own making for a moment, I can go back to painting for a while and see how things reform again after the shake-up. Suppressing the immune system of the painting. So on the left is a painting from my series Innate Sensing Mechanisms, and on the right is one from the Cytoskeleton series. Both use pattern to dazzle the eye. On the left, I'm dealing with a long-standing pictorial problem of how to introduce foreign objects into the pictorial field. I've used concentric lines to absorb these elements and in my mind, suppressing the immune system of the picture to accept the transplants that I want to make. This is a scrambling the coordinates of what collage is in order to refresh it and find new possibilities. The painting on the right is more recent and it achieves this in a much more sophisticated way. Paintings are inserted flush into the painting surface and the more complex pattern printed on vinyl becomes a common denominator between the shaped canvases, helping them sit comfortably in the eye. This is a painting called Prostate Palace from Alien Sex Club. It's 2.1 meters high and five meters wide and it was made in 2015. The title comes from a song I wrote which ultimately played within the installation. The painting isn't an illustration of the song. Having written the song, it provided me with another source to grab during the process of painting. When I needed a pictorial device, I could grab some words. The painting emerges out of my avoidance of and confrontation of the activity of painting via a sequence of displacement activities. 
I'm using the scrambling the coordinates as a kind of brain button to press that enables me to trick myself out of my habits and achieve something that surprises me. Sometimes this feels like an out of body experience as though somebody else has come along and made the painting for me. That's the absolutely ideal set of parameters. This is a still from my film, A Virus Walks Into a Bar. And this was made after Prostate Palace and it anthropomorphizes the life cycle of a virus as though we were somewhere between Coronation Street, the Teletubbies and Twin Peaks. It's a completely different activity to making the painting. It's highly collaborative. There's nearly 60 people involved in making the film. It's epic. Aside from the piece itself is the learning I acquired during the process of making the film and how that scramble in the coordinates for me um, was used for later returning to painting. So when I go back to painting in something like this, which is from the series Cofactors, it's called Triskelia, a year after the film, and three years after the Prostate Palace painting, I've come back to a similar size painting. They're both from much bigger series. I virtually never make anything stand alone. There's normally 10 or 20 of something. I think what's shifted during this time away, during other things, scrambling the coordinates, is a narrative change, a greater flatness. You can see that volume has been taken up by other media that I'm working in perhaps. And there's a different kind of line quality at work. Scrambling the coordinates means that the baseline of my artistic practice keeps shifting. So the starting point of the next activity is always different from the previous one. The coordinates don't unscramble back to their original position. A new norm emerges. The scrambled coordinates become familiar. A new strain attains dominance, to borrow an analogy from COVID and new mutations are required to keep the thing moving. Part of scrambling the coordinates is breaking the existing bonds between things, particles, images, ideas, and forming new ones. This is from my series Booze Paintings and incorporates some elements from previous works, which I've broken apart and recomposed. These works are all made with fabric and are printed, sewn, or appliqued together. They're visual equations. In complex adaptive systems, the thing can be decomposed as well as composed. It can be broken down, broken apart, and those parts can be combined into units, subunits, and larger parts that can then emerge into wholes. There is no end point. The work is constantly evolving. It eats itself and other things in order to move forward. Installations like Capsid deal with combinatorial problems linking chains of information together to create new ones, which come about when you start to assemble lots of units and subunits into a bigger composition. Daniel Dennett might call these cranes of design, not just physical building blocks, but intellectual ones as well. Here, there are so many moving parts, so many variables, some invisible, things like the people you've got to work with in order to achieve something like this that knowing where the coordinates are, mapping them and measuring them becomes important in making the experiment. Otherwise, it's just a chaos and a meaningless one at that. Models and architectural drawings become the mode of display for communicating this scale of thinking. Combinatorial problems exist in lots of disciplines. I was artist in residence at Kavli Institute in the Netherlands, where I was learning about their project to build a synthetic cell from scratch. Their analogies enabled me to create this shaped painting, which is resolved by combining a kind of internal architecture of lines and a system of inserted paintings, the equivalent of nano machines at a biological scale. On the right, the polymer is another kind of analogy for drawing diverse parts together. This chain of sculptures, some soft, some hydrographically wrapped, uses a rope to assemble a kind of visual syntax. Meaning forms rapidly out of meaninglessness. This is an early model for Mobius Hospice. I built it in tilt brush. I've been working in VR since around 2018. It's a proposal for a new kind of town 
built around death and dying and well-being. It would include a school, apartments that generate income, a cinema, a climbing wall, an incinerator, gym, library, cinema, care rooms, a hospital, and so on. It, it's all in order to rethink palliative care and what constitutes a good death. I'm an atheist and I don't want a religious charity looking after me should I need caring in my old age. And so that's really the starting point for this project. Mobius Hospice draws inspiration from Cre uh, CRISPR gene editing technology. This is a later iteration of the project transposed to the site of Barn Barton in Plymouth, where you are. It applies my tilt brush model to other sources, all combined in the gaming engine Unity. 2052, Barn Barton 2052, a good death, a good life, Barn Barton 2052. We're sailing on the River Tamar. I ducked at Kiln Bay. This is a great example of, of scrambling the coordinates. How does a theory adjust to fit onto a real site? By using the CRISPR analogy, I can delete architectural code from the site and copy and paste or insert new code to redesign the place and the hospice. The challenge with all technologies is to customize them. This is a still from my 360 video, The Fourth Wall. The VR work and the 360 videos I've made require that I disrupt the aesthetic provided by the software. Tilt brush, gravity sketch, photogrammetry, and in VR, etc. they all have their own identifiable look. How do you put the software under pressure to get it to look different, to do something new, to achieve something that nobody else has done with it? The answer is to scramble the coordinates of it, to use a gaming engine and combine it in ways that it wasn't intended. Three ball Hebridean machine walking down in Nanjing Street, singing My Black Hole puts the Y in Shanghai, and I'm gonna give that Chinese tweet a try. That's what I've been doing for Augmented Fashion, a project that I'm working on for Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, rethinking the Harris Tweed and what they call slow fashion and contrasting it with the textile industry in Shanghai and what you might call fast fashion. Using Unity as a combinatorial space has led me from VR to AR. This is a work in progress from a couple of months ago for the app I'm building. Here it is spawning nasturtiums and lichen, which are used to make dyes as part of the traditional weaving methods of the Outer Hebrides. Today, Mr. and Mrs. Jezreel have traveled from Gillingham, England, to share their urgent message with us of a sanctuary that they are building for God's chosen people, a structure of wonderment. This is the trailer for my 360 film that's currently exhibited at Exeter Phoenix. You all need to go and see this show. It tells the story of a real Victorian cult and the temple they built to house the lost tribes of Israel during the Day of Judgment. What's important in this context is that I've put the technology under pressure by combining 360 video, narrative cinema, digital painting and drawing. What emerges is a kind of next generation hybrid, a new kind of shonky. I'm showing the film on headsets that I've customized with masks that I've made, transforming the otherwise boring experience of watching people in headsets into watching strange aliens absorbed in some other world. Alongside the film, I'm showing the costumes that I wore to play all 31 parts, as well as wallpapers, watercolor drawings, and a short documentary. It's 360 in all senses, an immersion in the entire process of production. This is an excerpt from a performance called Hilary Mantel Megamix, which I made a few weeks ago in Exeter when Jezreel's Tower opened. Not 
The script employs a cut-up technique familiar from William Burroughs and David Bowie in which text is written or gathered and then cut and spliced, recombined into new form, which often gives it new meanings, frequently revealing the subconscious concerns of the maker. Here I've spliced together quotations from Hilary Mantel, Hilary DeVay and Hilary Clinton and mixed them with my own song lyrics and aphorisms created when I read. There's a lot to do with the prisoner's dilemma and theories about willpower. The performance is created by scrambling the verbal coordinates of the material I'm working with. And then by using narrative techniques, I can synthesize the diverse parts I've created back into a unified whole. So to conclude, the subject matter in the context of Hilary Mantel Megamix is the notion of an individual having a center of narrative gravity, a sense of self, when in fact, the self is a user illusion. And that user illusion keeps a lid on the competing forces operating inside your brain. The self is a useful trick of evolution that enables us to function as unique organisms. What I hope I've opened up for you today is the notion that your brain is home to an enormous array of contradictory forces, all fighting for your attention. These forces, memes, a software that has been downloaded onto your brain. The memes use your brain to replicate themselves. You think the memes are yours. You feel a sense of identity because of them, but they're nobodies, they're just replicators. My challenge to you is to begin to view the world of objects, ideas, texts, buildings, styles, etc., as worlds of competing memes to see yourself as a vehicle for those memes, as well as a driver of them. By assuming this ambivalent position and in choosing scrambling the coordinates as your strategy for engineering them, you stand some chance of surviving and maybe thriving. Thank you. Now is the time for questions. <laughs> Thanks, John, that is so interesting on many many levels that was really really great good super relatable to as well i'd forgotten uh the dorkin genes to memes um thing but so kind of relevant really to now and and powerful as good. well but i love the idea of scrambling the coordinates as a kind of conceptual framework yeah, as a it way seems of to, it seems to bring everything together somehow. <laughs> it does. I mean, I you know, there's there's quite a lot of really nice theoretical reference in your talk as well, which is kind of underpinning the framework of it, which is really yeah. If people lovely. want to follow things up, they can. You know, Dennett is a great reference. Daniel yes. Dennett um, for yeah. thinking about these things. Yeah, and also I think that what probably would resonate for a lot of our our guys on the call here is that uh, putting technology under pressure is also really really interesting to get something new from it it's a little bit like i know we're post digital now but yeah. we are kind of, we for us that understand a kind of analog framework it's very interesting to 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 want when we when we deal with technology we want to treat it like an analog yes we want to push it yeah and stick our fingers in it and make it do things that it's not meant to do and that's a lovely yeah. thing about testing the technology and i think we you know ultimately there's some group of bods at google or whoever makes oculus things you know setting this stuff up there's a group of people the equivalent to us in this room deciding what this stuff does and how it looks now why should they have the say you know once we get our hands on it we need to mess with it but also the more um accurately we can be about knowing what we're starting with we can measure what we do to it and that's where the memes thing is useful because uh, in in just taking things as we find them and not really questioning where they've come from we can't really engineer them very well this way we can pro probably do some good work on them i think lovely lovely let's open it out so anybody just pop up Pop a question either in the chat if you don't want to talk or well, show your talk. face. Come on. Yeah, show your faces. It's not scary. Uh, <laughs> I'm just a person with a blue screen. <laughs> Hello. How are you, Polly? I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much for that talk, John. I really enjoyed it. I know we agreed that I would 
ask you a question about collars, but oh, actually yeah. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to ask something else though, if that's okay. <laughs> Please do. So my question is really interesting. I, um, one of the things that I was thinking about that keeps kind of going around in my mind, you were talking, when you were talking about the prostate palace mm. and the paintings, you were talking mm. about um, <clears throat> tricking oneself. Mm. And I think, you know, one of the ways that you know, all the things that you've been talking about is uh, mixed um, methods of making, uh, mm. scrambling and, uh, you know, the whole challenges that we have there with technology. So my question is around about it, and maybe you could say a little bit more about tricking oneself or mm. even if you're still doing that. Um, yeah. I'd be interested to find out. OK, the, the book I've just read um, is all about willpower and, and I'm very focus at the moment on this idea that um there's multiple people that there's multiple voices inside each other we've acquired them through our parents through the people that teach us through the things we've gravitated towards i have an obsession with Pee Wee herman so things often emanate from my mouth that sound like him but in terms of our uh, design voice those things will be competing too. And those are appetites. You know, Robert Rauschenberg will talk about, I need to make the, the all white series, but then I need to make the combines because it's like needing an avocado for lunch and some meat for dinner. Um, I, once you've been around the block a few times, I'm 43, I've been making paintings since I was a kid, but really got into it in my teens. I know some of the games. Then when I acquire a new bit of software or a new technique, I can learn the games again. To get outside of my own knowledge or my own sophistication or my own savvy, it's harder and harder to set up situations in which I can trick myself. And that is what I mean also by scrambling the coordinates and obstacle courses. Now, it might take me five years to have a breakthrough. And those breakthroughs would come weekly when I was 15. Now, when they come, they're amazing, but they're rare because I have to do something much more adventurous to get out of my depth. But also it's about trying to get inside the niches, the gaps in between the learning, because I do all these things. How do you weave in? So it's a much more complicated problem that I don't fully have the grasp on, but I think I'm still dealing with it. Yeah, I com yeah, I completely get that. Yeah, the older the you become, you have you know more um, uh, information about things. I mean, I I often actually talk with the students about sneaking up on work. Yeah, sneaking up so that you see mm. it with, before it sees you. Yeah, and I think there's, there's, a, there's a kind of element of that that goes with it. And de Kooning would call it the slipping glimpser, which is you know he, he's painting with his left hand or finding ways to to again trick himself out of his habits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I've got loads more questions, but I'll open it for others. So it's great cool. to see you again. <laughs> you too. Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, Hello. Like, what kind of formal training did you have like, um, like growing so up? I did a foundation course at Chelsea, and then I did my undergraduate studies at Oxford at the Ruskin School of Drawing and Fine Art. Then I did my MA at the Slade. Then several years later, I did a PhD in architecture at the University of Westminster. So I'm overqualified, Drew. Awesome. And like, um, kind of what, like, I guess, uh, what, what kind of draws you towards like Oculus, like, uh, you know, the tech side of things that was specifically yeah. about that interests you? Well, it's just, it's a thing that's there, isn't it? And I suppose I think to myself, well, I'd, I'd like to know about that. And then because I come from painting, I'll approach it slightly differently to an architect or to a sculptor or to an animator. And that sensibility, that difference in sensibility and knowing that you're coming from a position this is again to reiterate the points I've made in the talk, can give you some control over what you might do with it differently to somebody else. Does that make sense? So I can go in there and I can draw, but it's not going to be like how you, an architect will draw with it. And that's interesting. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free to ask anything. It can be mundane. Uh, yeah, hi, sorry, I just, hi. who came up with the phrase scrambling the coordinates? Who did you say that was? Arakawa and Gins. Arakawa and Gins. And cool. they uh, are Japanese and an American, and they built several projects uh, in Japan. They built a whole park called the Reversible Destiny Park, which I'm hoping to visit when COVID restrictions lift. 
They also built a, the Reversible Destiny House in Long Island. There's a foundation devoted to them. Um, if you go onto my website and look at the Shonky page, you'll find more about them there. But also Reversible Destiny has its own website. So look them up. They're good. Cool. Thanks very much. Cheers. Hi, John. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Steve. I've got a question for you, John. Uh, you see what you said about scrambling the, mm. the coordinates? Does that work in other uh, matters of, let's say, uh, visuality or design, anything, even numbers? Because the reason why I'm asking this, uh, relating to what you, you've just been saying about paintings and stuff, the project that I'm working on at the moment, I was supposed to, uh, uh, to, to elaborate a design, and then mm. I find that the, the dimensions of it is three to uh, three meters, 0.25 square, and they all and it's all related to each other. The all factors of each other is like 1.8 meter by 1.8 meter, 1.8 meter by 1.8 meter. Even when I work out the scale factors, it, it comes up nine centimeters. And then if I if I if I use a different capacity of me measure, it's always landing on the same factor <laughs> dimension. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's quite nice, and, isn't it? Yeah, and then I just love it, you know what I mean? Even yeah. with paintings like you showed, you know, you can make blue from yellow and green. You can, you you know, but I, 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 think, I struggle. I think what I'm saying is that this is an idea that can be applied across to across anything. And I, I'm telling it through my own journey, but it, uh, what I'm suggesting to you, because of the breadth of what I do, and I've only shown you a tiny slice of my output today, is to say this can apply to you too as a methodology. So this could be an architectural notion, this can be uh, a product design notion, this can be a mathematical notion, absolutely. What it is is about saying, what's the current situation I find myself in or the thing, the problem in, and how do I slightly twist it to get it off course that it could trigger a, 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 an interesting discovery? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it, it does. But one thing that I struggle with, that what you've just explained there, it, in my head, I can visualize what you're saying, but I'm I understand exactly what you're saying because I can, I can possibly not quite, but because I'm. What I'm I would say, Steve, is let it just drip in. Don't don't expect this to suddenly go in in one go. This is something you're going to return to. Being confused about what I've said might be the best thing that could happen to you. And you'll have a eureka moment in about three months when you'll go, oh my God, I get it. Okay, thank you, John. But I'm, I'm definitely over, overly excited about the particle aspect of the, some of the work he, he I'm joined. excited that you're excited. <laughs> thank you, John. It's a puzzle. Thank you very much. You're welcome.